with our final 10 questions of the test here. Uh, we're starting off with 51. Uh, two distinct sets of sulfur fluorine bond lengths. When I re read this question, I immediately went to C, because uh, I know it's trigonal pyramidal, and, or seesaw, but trigonal py pyramidal and electronic geometry, and that to me was probably going to be the different bond length. So let's draw these Lewis structures really quickly. Good way to do this if you're not familiar with uh, formal charge is to use formal charge. And so I'm going to get my fluorine set, and then I'm going to say, okay, one, two electrons in the sulfur, so they have formal charge of zero. For a neutral molecule, and I need that sulfur to be neutral, I need that. That's a tetrahedral base, and so those two fluorine lengths are going to be the same. Uh, sulfur, double bond to an oxygen, single bond to fluorine, single bond to fluorine. So we've got one, two, three, four electrons, we need two more. That again, we've got one, two, three, four electron domains, it's tetrahedral, it's going to be trigonal pyramidal, so that's going to be the same two fluorine lengths. And then SF4. We're going to have the equatorial positions in one axial. Just kidding. We have both of the axial, and then we're going to have one lone pair at one of the equatorial positions. So we have our seesaw shape, um, and that you're going to see different bond lengths potentially for these two, I guess. I'm going to trust that that's what that's going on there. Because SF6 is octahedral. So in that case, we're looking at a situation where. where everything's going to be the same. I'm not going to put the electron dots in the last ones here. Uh, the reason for this, because these are different locations away, might change the repulsion and attraction levels between the different things. So that might cause the axial and equatorial, uh, I'm sorry, equatorial and axial positions to be different in bond length. So C was the answer. I don't want that ended up being correct. Okay, uh, three sigma bonds and one pi bond. So we're looking probably at a double bond and then two other single bonds. Um, so again, we draw Lewis structures real quick. I'm gonna leave the lone pairs off on the uh, external parts, but if you have three, three single bonds, uh, NH4 plus, four single bonds, uh, C2H2, acetylene or ethyne, is going to have three sigma, but it's gonna have two pi bonding interactions. And carbonate, the last one, so since we haven't had a right answer yet, we're hoping. And this is of course going to resonate, uh, but within its resonance we're going to have three sigma interactions and that high delocalization over the whole thing. A few of your interests. Okay. So some little structure questions here at the end, and then some of these questions get incredibly weird. This is one that I wasn't really sure what to do with, so I got this one wrong when I did it initially. Uh, very difficult question. Um, so the answer to this is D, and so what I'm going to do for you is try and show you how I worked out what the six different isomers would be. So what I did was I said, okay, well, I could have the cobalt and I could have a chlorine. Basically, we're dealing with an octahedron, so if we set one chlorine here, it can either be at one of the four in this kind of equatorial plane, or it can be at the axial position. So if we put the chlorines there, then what we can do is we can have the ammonias across from one another, which would leave the uh, cyanides across from one another as well. So basically in this case, everything is located opposite one another. Okay. Then we could also do the cobalt to the chlorine to the chlorine, Okay, so an axial kind of position. And we can set up where we have ammonia on one side, a cyanide on another, and then uh, a cyanide in one way and an ammonia the other way. So these would be different from one another. And this one, the cyanides would both come in and out. Okay. Then we could also have cobalt to chlorine. Make sure I'm not missing any. Okay. So cobalt to chlorine, where they are not crossing one another. Okay. Um, and then we can have just the ammonias across from one another, cyanides not. And then we can also have cobalt, chlorine, chlorine. And we can have the ammonias at this angle, but then have the cyanides be apart from one another. And then there are two where nothing is apart from one another. So, make sure I get this right. So we're going to have the chlorines here. 
and let's see if we can draw this in 3D and get the whole thing. So we're kind of leaving out different pieces that are going in and out of the board here. So I'm going to have the cobalt, some chlorine, some ammonia, and some chlorine. case I have chlorine opposite of cyanide and ammonia basically everything is opposite of everything here what I can do is I can draw the mirror image of this and that will be an enantiomer of this and that will be my sixth isomer but these will be non-superimposable mirror images because I reversed them so we have one two three four five six isomers um, we have one with chlorines apart from each other and everything else is different. Uh, one where everything is axial from one another. Uh, we have one where only the ammonias are apart from one another, one where the cyanides are only apart from one another, and then two different enantiomers where everything is apart from everything. So never do have anything line up. Okay, so those are the six isomers. If you got that, wonderful. If there's a better way to do that, sure let me know. Um, Okay, and then this one, I ended up getting right, but I think I was a little lucky on this. So when I drew this, I started with my two methyl groups, bonded to the nitrogen. Okay, and it kind of looked like, what's going on with this nitrogen? So what I did was I, I drew this, where I have a positive charge. Oh, I'm sorry. And... So I drew this as my first Lewis structure. Uh, negative formal charge on an oxygen, positive on a nitrogen, uh, and that's also a nitrogen surrounded by a lot of things of electron density. So I liked that Lewis structure. Um, and then I, I went ahead and looked and I said, okay, well I can, I can, um, I really can't do anything except I could bring in the electrons here, bring these in here and kick these out to here. Okay, uh, it would be the only other alternative. So that, look like this. I have CH3 to an N of CH3. I have a lone pair here and then I would have a single bond, no, double bond, double bond, like that. Okay, and I would have a discharge here. I missed something. No, that's something extra. This should not be here. Sorry, this should be just single bond. Okay. doing something wrong here. Let's see. One, two, three. So this is no formal charge, no formal charge, no formal charge. Double electrons. So this should not be drawn from over here. Sorry about that. Okay, this, this electron pair seems to still linger. So these are the two different Lewis structures we drew. And I think just going through objectively, you have no formal charge at all here. It'd be easy to select this one, which actually ends up being a completely different answer. So that ends up being that this one is trigonal pyramidal, and then this one is bent, which will lead us towards D. Um, I just happen to look out and draw this one first, which gives me a trigonal planar and then a bent over here and I selected B. Uh, and thinking back, I think in the previous year they had a similar question about a similar compound like this, where you have what you would traditionally pick, and then another one that makes sense, but probably wouldn't come out as the better Lewis structure. Uh, and in the same case, they ended up picking the one where it had more formal charge. Uh, so there appears to be something where you have a nitrogen to a nitrogen to an oxygen, that you need to kind of go against the grain there. Now, I ended up looking out, but I think most people would select this one, and not this one, but this ends up being the correct answer. Okay, so next we're looking at an esterification reaction. For that, we need an acid catalyst. 
Um, I had thought that esterification could be done under basic conditions. I didn't know the mechanism, but the Fisher esterification mechanism definitely is an acid catalyst. If you've done this in the lab, you've used probably sulfuric acid as the catalyst. Uh, reducing and oxidizing agents aren't necessary. You're just trying to get the reaction to take place. Um, and so, so anyway, I thought that this was correct and that this was a possibility. So I went with A on that one. I later looked it up and this is not possible to do a sterification with a basic catalyst. So A was the simple answer there. Okay, uh, and then this one, um, if, if you have, so obviously iodide is going to be easier to leave than chlorine. It's a bigger atom, it's more polarizable, it's easier to break that bond. So we should not be picking either one of A or C. So then you're looking at a case where you have um, a CH2I group. So you have iodine on a, what, secondary carbon? primary carbon, sorry, um, like this, one more metal group there, sorry, and then you have the CH3I, and so this one is, is so much bulkier, and really, I looked this up in organic textbook, and I saw that if you have a, like a methyl group with a halogen, your rate of reaction for a substitution reaction is going to be incredibly faster. Like, I don't know what their exact rates were, but it was something of a ratio of like 100, and then when you got to a primary carbon, it dropped down to like 3. So somewhere like 20 to 50 times faster. So B is your answer there for that. Okay. Um, and then C6H14, I'm going to go in skeletal structures here. So you have your hexane chain. That's one of your isomers. And then for five carbons, you can have two methyl pentane and you can have three methyl pentane. You can't have four because that's two methyl pentane. And then if you have four carbons, you can have two three dimethyl or you can have two two dimethyl. So there are five total isomers for C6H14. Okay, uh, 58, I just happen to know from IV chemistry, uh, if you do benzene, react it with nitric and sulfuric. Uh, the nitric and sulfuric create N NO2 group, um, and this goes in equilibrium with the nitric acid, and then the uh, electrons from the benzene ring will attach to the nitrogen, which creates a nitro group. So that's kind of what happens in that, uh, but this is used to add a nitro group. You can also further reduce this to an amine group by adding 10 hydrochloric acid and then neutralizing the excess acid. So, not really sure how you would know that other than that. So the last two questions get pretty dicey. Um, this one I didn't know at all. I ended up picking the wrong answer, but um, I can tell you a little bit about what I've read since. So we're looking at a reaction that's going on and then we introduce some urea and the activity is lost. Okay, now it doesn't say that it slows down, it says lost. And so the answer that that affects is A, because A talks about a competitive binding situation, which would be where the urea binds to the active site and then leaves or the uh, substrate binds. And so what we'd see is we'd see the activity drop, but we wouldn't see it be lost. And so that's trying to tell us that A is not the correct answer. After that, you're looking at two different scenarios. Uh, one has urea um, breaking apart some bonds in the enzyme, whether it's peptide bonds or disulfide bonds. And then the other one, it says it causes it to denature and lose its shape, okay? Um, so, so any of these really could be at, at denaturing and losing its three-dimensional shape. Uh, and that's where Google search showed up that urea tends to disrupt interactions with intermolecular forces. And so these being intramolecular forces and this being an intermolecular force, uh, really the denaturing and the losing of that structure is usually based on the folding which comes about through intermolecular forces. So C is the answer. How you would know that, I'm not incredibly sure. Uh, I'm not particularly strong in biochem. So. Alright, and then the very last question is a uh, it's also a little bit of a doozy. So we have two different um, structures. We have a sucrose and a lactose. And it says, which sugar would give a positive Tollens test? So to the untrained eye, which is probably all of us, or most of us, um, neither one of these has an aldehyde group present. So for an aldehyde, we're looking for a C, develop onto an O, followed by a hydrogen, okay? Now, it turns out that any monosaccharide, both of these are disaccharides, any monosaccharide will get a positive test for the Tollens reagent. 
because not only does it react with aldehydes, but it also reacts with ketones. And some sugars are contain ketone groups, and some contain aldehydes, but in the, uh, in the linear form, all of them have one or the other. So, so really, the answer to this question is, is something that, which of these can break apart its ring? Now, when the ring forms, there's a specific carbon that interacts with an oxygen. And in sucrose, um, both of those carbons are attached to this group right here. And so what happens is, that ends up where it can't actually open up the rings, and so it kind of stuck as it is. So sucrose doesn't react with this particular test, but lactose, on the other hand, can do it, okay? And so what ends up happening is, we have a split occur right here. Okay, and what's gonna happen is this is going to turn into an aldehyde, so we're, we're oxidizing this carbon, and then this is going to become an alcohol group. And so we see kind of from here, the oxygen with the hydroxyl group there, another hydroxyl group there, and then we open this up and form the aldehyde. And then over here we have the alcohol chain off of here, and another hydroxyl group there. And so this will give the positive test for this. Now, um, these are called reducing sugars, uh, so lactose is one, and, and I got this right uh, <laughs> through good fortune. And the way that I, I knew it was not through any of this knowledge, it was kind of just lucky, but I, I run the Tollens mirror thing, and when I do, I use dextrose. And so when I read the question, my thought process was, well, if sucrose had worked, I would assume that my instructions would have been to use that, because this is cheaper and more readily available. So the fact that I used dextrose made me think, okay, well, that's probably not it. And then from there, I, I kind of went test mode and said, well, the complexity of the question makes me think that one of them would be uh, working for this. And so otherwise, I'd expect it to see an aldehyde group. I assume something had to be going on within the rings opening up, forming a linear chain in order to get this to work. So I ended up picking two only as my best choice, and that happened to work out. But again, if you happen to have known how to know that in advance, feel free to kind of leave a comment on what we should be doing in the future.